With inspiration from my guest, Mark McGinnis, you may find yourself integrating poetry into your writing life as both a pleasure and a practice. I'm Ann Croker, writing coach. If you're tuning in for the first time, welcome. If you're a regular, welcome back. I'm sharing my best tips and training skills and strategies to help writers improve their craft pursue publishing, and achieve their writing goals. Today, I have Mark McGinnis on the show, a poet from Bristol, UK. On his poetry podcast, A Mouthful of Air, Mark interviews contemporary poets to discover their writing practice and draws out insights that can help any writer become more creative, expressive, and memorable. Mark also takes classic poems apart to show us how they work and what we as writers can learn from the examples of poets like Yeats, Shakespeare, Thomas Hardy, Chaucer, and Edward Lear. Listen in on our conversation. I am so excited to have Mark McGinnis on the call today on our show. And we are going to talk about a lot of different things related to the creative life, the writing life, even the poetry life. Mark, thanks for being on the call. Thank you. Anne. It's lovely to be here. And I am looking forward to learning more about how you approach your own creative life and how you use and enable uh, poetry to be part of what feeds your creative life, what, how you inspire others with poetry, because that seems to be mm -hmm. a big part of your life. Can you tell um, the, the listeners and viewers, can you tell yeah. us a little bit more about who you are and what you do? Sure. I am a poet living in Bristol in the southwest of England in the UK. I, you know, I've been writing poetry quite a while and I'm always the, you know, in my typical group of friends, I'm usually the one who reads poetry. And, you know, I've always been quite aware that most people don't read poetry most of the time. You know, there's a lot of people who are very literate, very well read, very avid readers, but who will generally read anything but poetry. And to my point of view, it's not that hard. And I think a lot of people get put off at school. They have a bad experience or they think it's this thing up on a pedestal that they don't understand or that it doesn't really isn't going to speak to them in their lives. And I got this urge about two years ago when I first got the idea for the show that I would really like to take some of these books behind me down from the shelf and just read a poem and just share it with people and say, isn't that great? And notice what, what's happening in the third line here. And, and isn't it marvelous what, what she's done with the, with the rhyme or, or whatever. And just to share the magic that I feel that I don't think it's that hard for other people to, to tune into. Um, mm. And then following on from that, I thought, well, actually I know quite a few poets um, I've been to their readings, I've read their books, I've sat next to them in workshops. I, it, why don't I invite them on the show too? And then they can read it. And so the the way the show works is that every episode is focused on one poem. And the first thing you hear is the poem, because you don't, if it's a good poem, you don't need an introduction. You don't need to be told why you should like it or or all the, you know, the footnotes and stuff. You either like it or you don't, or you feel something or you don't, but you've really got to listen and put your kind of assumptions aside about it. So we hear the poem read by either me, if it's a, a dead poet, if they're alive, I get them on the show and they read it themselves. And then we have a little bit of context, a little bit of, well, what's going on in the poem? And again, if, if they're alive and they're on the show, I'll, I'll ask them, where did the poem come from? How did you get the idea? How did you work it up? What process did you go through from the initial idea to, to what we have on the page or, or on the screen or in, in the ear? And quite often that journey is, is really surprising. I mean, as a, as a writer, I'm fascinated by how things evolve. Um, and if, it's, if the poet is sadly no longer with us, then I will share my thoughts on why I think the poem is worthy of our attention and what I think is is going on. And then the end of the show, we hear the poem again. And even though it's the same poem and the same recording, it should sound different. In fact, listeners tell me it sounds different because it's a bit like a magic eye because they can see things or they can hear things in it that they weren't aware of the first time round. So, so that's it. It's all quite self-contained. That is a wonderful concept. I took an online course 
in years past where we did these close readings and mm. it just opened my mind up. It took me back in time. I actually studied poetry and creative writing as an undergraduate at mm -hmm. a Big Ten University here in the States. Yeah. And so I have a little exposure to poetry and it mm -hmm. was my entree into writing and building a writing life. So tell tell us what the name of the of the show is and why you chose it. Okay, it is called A Mouthful of Air. And I know it's a good title because I nicked it from W.B. Yeats in one, a little poem that he wrote, an early love poem, where he, um, would you like to hear it? It's really short. It's easier than sure, me describing it. of course. It. Okay, so it's called, He Thinks of Those Who Have Spoken Evil of His Beloved. And, you know, it's not hard for us to guess that his beloved was likely to be Maud gone famously. He was in, in love with her. She was a, a significant figure in the Irish um, political um, independence movement in the late 19th century. So it begins, it's just six lines. So, so blink and you miss it, but it goes, half close your eyelids, loosen your hair and dream about the great and their pride. They have spoken against you everywhere. But weigh this song with the great and their pride. I made it out of a mouthful of air. Their children's children shall say they have lied. And I love the fact that Yeats there, you know, he emphasizes that a poem, in which case a song, he was a very lyric poet. He says, he emphasizes how light how insubstantial it is. It's almost nothing. Weigh this song. So, so you know, she's being criticized by people he doesn't like, the great and their pride. And he's saying, but, you know, you, you, you can't, don't respond to the criticism, just weigh this song with it. Almost as though he's saying that poetry can balance the scales of this injustice. And he says, I made it out of a mouthful of air. So that's what the poem is made of. It's, it's made of speech. It's made of breath. And of course, this takes us back to the, the origins of poetry, which is even older than writing. So it would have been spoken or maybe sung um, way back before people thought of writing poems down. And I think this is something, for me, something quite magical about poetry, that that insubstantial thing, you're making it out of nothing, really, a mouthful of air, that still survives into the 21st century. And I thought, isn't that a lovely um, way of thinking about a poem and it's perfect for a podcast because what you get on the podcast of course is the spoken poem again we've gone from the text to the back to speech so that's where I got it it's both literal and metaphor and metaphor mm. is such a big part of poetry and we can grab it most of the people I think listening to my show are writing prose or novels or short stories or essays mm -hmm. or articles and probably fewer writing poetry tell me how you feel like this we can translate things like metaphor used commonly in poetry how can we translate that into our other forms of writing well without I'm thinking, being without being weird i mean i'm thinking i can i can tell you about how to do it as a poet and i use it a lot i think i use it quite a lot in my non-fiction writing so i write about the creative process sometimes but i think it's probably basically the same process which is you know what is on, on some level the question you're asking yourself is what does this remind me of or what is this like and you're giving and you're just allowing that thought to come maybe from the back of the mind to the front of the mind. You know, that if you have a um, an image, of, and, and I would say pay attention to the imagery in your mind. You know, if you're picturing a character, say, and there's an image of a waterfall in your mind, just trust that and say, you know, she was like a waterfall. I mean, that's a simile technically rather than metaphor, but you know what I mean. It's the same kind of. Um, figurative language, I would say, and or or listen and take seriously the, the the words on the tip of your tongue. If you start to to say, "I'm feeling really, I'm feeling really heavy today," then just go with that heavy feeling. Or you know, he was feeling heavy. It, 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 he he felt the weight of the world on his shoulders. I know that's a cliche, but you can just 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 go with that kind of language. 
I think. And the other thing I would say, of course, is read lots of poems because you get loads and loads of metaphors and they just lodge in your mind and get you into that way of thinking. I appreciated how you modeled that close reading of the Yeats poem for us. And I think just with that alone, you've given us a powerful tool to do that, to pull a poetry book off the shelf or look one mm -hmm. up online, read it, and and then pause and look for those. That would be a great place to start, I think, with metaphor. I agree. And I, I have a question for you. Yeah. If you were, what comes to mind when you think about your own writing life, what metaphor comes to mind for yourself? Oh. The image that came to mind then was a kind of a, almost like a, a riverbank. And, but it, it's going up, there's the river down below, but then there's the bank leading up and there's kind of trees and branches and hedges up there. And there's all the life going on up there. But I'm waving my hand about for anyone listening to the audio version. <laughs> and I guess it feels if I'm writing, I'm gonna go and, I'm going to go down here, down by the river, and I'm just going to be out of sight for a little while. I can hear, you know, the world is still within earshot. I can listen to that. I can tune into that, but I can also listen, very much listening to the, the river that is going in my other ear. And I feel quite earthed and, I don't know, you can't quite say watered, can you, the connection for water. But there's a, a connection to the earth and, and water, which is feels quite true to the the spirit i guess of what i well that was the image that came to mind you know yeah you know, i'm sure i could run with that plenty into yeah. that yeah exactly my mind was going toward i'm imagining you dipping into that river that's always flowing and you do that with poetry and you're dipping in you're dipping yeah in, yeah yeah, yeah. Bit, you that's know? it yeah. that's absolutely and maybe take some back up over the hedge yeah yeah hey drink this taste yeah, this that's it yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, maybe that's it. Maybe that's good. Have have you has your writing life evolved like f in a dramatic way, a subtle way from your origins? Which maybe tell us about those origins and then walk us through. Huh, that's a good question. I would say my poetry, in one sense, has stayed the same. Which is that. So I remember the first time I really got excited about writing poetry. We were at school and my English teacher, Jeff Riley, wonderful guy, great teacher, he set us the task of writing a ballad based on the novel that we were reading. And I, we got started in it in the class and then we you know, had to go into the next class. It was probably chemistry or something deathly boring like that. And I found myself at the back of the class with my jotter, which I don't know if your listeners are familiar with that term. It's basically the, the rough notebook that we have with really awful paper um, that would probably take your skin off if you rubbed against it too, <laughs> too hard. And I was writing in my jotter and I kept going with the back. I, I sat at the back of the class and kind of hid it behind my bag. And I was really, I should have been doing chemistry, but I, was kept, I just couldn't get this, the, the rhythm of this ballad, which is, you know, ballads is a very strong rhythm out of my mind and I kept going through chemistry and history and goodness knows what. And I'm normally, you know, I always normally was the boringly good student who would be paying attention dutifully, but I couldn't, there was this mischievous thing in the poem. And years later I interviewed the poet Paul Farley, who's one of our foremost poets here. And he said to me something that really resonated. He said, because I was asking him about his writing life and he said, I feel like I have to be skiving off to write. So skiving off is British slang for, um, maybe you call it playing hooky, running away from school. Um, yes. He said, I feel I have to be skiving off from something else. Like maybe he was supposed to be writing a, I don't know, review or a lecture or whatever, and he would be scribbling it in the margin. And I could really relate to that. And I think, you know, coming back to your question, my poetry writing life is, is not a million miles away from that, that the poem is something that will come along and interrupt or tap me on the shoulder when I'm doing something else or even when I'm trying to sleep at three o'clock in the morning is quite inconvenient sometimes. Um, but I do have a rule with myself is whatever else I'm doing, unless I'm in front of a client, I am allowed to go with the poem. Even if I've said to myself, I'll be writing a podcast episode or something this morning, 
I'm allowed to write that poem because it's a bit like a leprechaun, you know, the, the Irish leprechaun, the little spirit, it's supposed to appear in front of you. And if you and you mustn't take your eyes off him because he's got a pot of gold at the end of his rainbow. And if you make him, he has to give you the pot of gold. But if you look away and he will use ev all his tricks to get you to look away, he'll disappear. And I think the poem's a bit like that, at least the initial idea. You've got to grab it before it vanishes. And then I will and then there will be endless tweakings and revisions and rewritings over and over again. So I guess as far as poetry goes, it's like that. It's still quite it's still quite feral, quite wild. Um for for prose I've got a pretty well established routine, which is I write in the mornings and um I do all my other stuff in the afternoon. Um do you no go ahead. I love hearing about your process. Well, that was something, that was a decision I made about 15 years ago when I realized that my my email inbox and my phone and running around after other people was was running my schedule, my, my day. Um, and I thought, no, you've got to draw a line in the sand. You've got to actually start the day by writing and making something, not just reacting. And at that stage, I was so busy, I got up at six o'clock in the morning to write this blog. I had an idea for launching a blog. Um, but the habit stuck with me. And fortunately, um, I've now managed to move the date further forward into the day, partly due to having children when I <laughs> capture every ounce of sleep I possibly could when they were small. Um, but I still like that intentionality that that gives my day that I'm starting off, I'm going to create something. And then later on, there's plenty of things that I need and want to do for other people, but this is the thing I do that feeds me first thing. The do you identify in as a writer? Do you identify first and foremost as a poet who writes prose, or someone who writes prose yes. and uses poetry? It's poet. the first. Poet comes first. That's poet, that's much more exciting, first. at least in my mind. I because uh, yeah. I mean that's to me that is the most exciting form of reading or writing. You know, and I love prose as well. Don't get me wrong, but. Um, you know what poetry gives me is 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 that it's even more concentrated even more magical what do you think is the 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 biggest gift that a poem gives is it the play with words is it conveying an idea slant is it something else so there's a lot of pleasure in poetry and i think that's something that's easily overlooked like we listen to music, we listen to songs because they're fun. You know, it's not because we feel we ought to understand figurative language and Bob Dylan's use of, you know, the metaphor, you know, whatever. It's because it's a great tune and we like the sound of it and it sticks in our head. And to me, at first and foremost, poetry is like that. But, or rather, and also, I, you know, because I had to really think about this when I was launching the poetry podcast. Well, what does it do? And to me, it helps me make sense of the world. And that's reading and writing. And of course, Robert Frost put it much better than I did when he said, a poem begins in delight and ends in wisdom. It becomes a, a momentary stay against confusion. And I just think that's so, so beautifully and precisely put, because it's momentary. It's not like this is the truth, capital letters, and it will always be, but a moment where you get, oh, yeah, actually, yeah, I've got that. When you read the poem or, or, or writing, it's yes, yes, I captured that. And then, of course, you know, we're back in the flow of confusion. But uh, yeah, that, that delight and wisdom, that'll do me for poetry. Where is that? I want to know the source of that quote. It was That's one of these, I think he made it as like an offhand remark, or maybe in one of his interviews or talks, or I, I'd like to think he sat down and considered it because, I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty good, isn't it? It's like you prepared that for this. Yeah. It's a prepared wow. line. That's right. <laughs> wow. So <clears throat> when you think back to all the things that you have done and achieved as a writer, what are you most proud of? Um, the poems that, that sing to me and also I've heard they sing to it. They, they sing or they speak to other people. Um, and I won't lie, you know, if a if a poet I really admire 
says, oh, I like that one. You know, that means a lot. You know, I, I think when you've got a fellow practitioner who's further down the path than you who says, okay, there's there's something there. But it's, yeah, because I, th I mean, ego aside and validation and aside, I think it's a sense of, yes, I did, at least I captured that. At least I managed to, to kind of make sense of that little corner of the universe. That's quite satisfying. And that that input that you're getting that gives you that you know it sang to somebody and it 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 landed right. Yeah. Is that happening because it is it did get accepted to a journal and it's been read or available to the public? Or does this happen privately? And I'm asking because I'm thinking about all the people who are working so hard privately at their computers, at their notebooks, writing poems, writing other things, essays and whatever, and they're hearing no from the gatekeepers. So yeah, I'm just yeah. curious if some of this this input that you're getting, like how are you getting it? Well, first of all, I'll say, you know, if you want to get a lot more no's, then, then write poetry. Because the amazing, <laughs> thing, the amazing thing is, you know, you walk down the street, you never meet a poet, and you submit to a poetry magazine, and suddenly there's hundreds of them in the inbox next to you. And I know this because I edited a poetry magazine once and I saw what a mind boggling number of poems come in. So, uh, you know, I'm there with you. If you're getting the no's, I get more no's than yeses. Most, most people do just because of the numbers, but, but, and, but the, the yeses outweigh the no's. And Going back to your original question, which I think is a really good one, it's interesting because the ones that come to mind aren't publications or prizes. You know, when you ask the question, it was times when I've sat down, you know, when a poet is tutoring me, because that's when you actually see the, you know, the real response, the one that they can't fake. Either, either they frown <laughs> or that, you know, their face lights up and you go, and you can see even before they said something, Oh, that one connected, and then they, you know, they will say something. So, because when you get accepted, generally, um, generally you don't get a lot of feedback. It's just, hey, great poem, thanks. We're we're pleased to have it. Um, whereas in a tuition situation or mentoring situation, I think you're more likely to get a the emotional response and b the more fulsome, detailed feedback. So, I would say if anybody is in that situation, get great feedback find a tutor, find a mentor, somebody who really knows your genre. And they're not just going to give you general praise, but they can give you really specific pra you know, praise or, or, you know, be, be open to the criticism if it's not, um, if it's not, if it's not there yet, but that's, but that can really help you calibrate because it's, I, I think another thing I would say based on the, the experience of having edited a magazine is when we submit, I think there's always a little frightened part of us that's thinking, oh, will I be good enough? And if you get rejected, it's, I wasn't good enough. My poem wasn't good enough. I'm not good enough. But rest assured, when I edited, it was Magma Poetry Magazine, there were plenty of poems that weren't of a great quality. That's true. But there were also far more poems that were good enough, in other words, well-written enough, than I had room for in the magazine. And so at that point, it came down to my taste. It came down to the kind of context. You know, there were several, some poems would form little constellations together. They would be on the same topic or around. They seemed to speak to each other. They kind of, you know, looked out, out for each other. And then the poor, you know, poem about a subject completely different wasn't left on its own. It was harder to justify leaving that in. So, um so just ever since then, I've realized it's not just about being good enough, whatever that means. It's, it will, so you, you know, maybe think about before you submit, they always say, read, read the magazine or read the, you know, the books published by whatever you really should, because that'll give you an idea of, of the kind of stuff that, that gets published there. Um, sometimes it helps to get an idea of, you know, if there's a judge for a competition, sometimes I've entered because I thought, Ooh, I like their stuff. I wonder what they think of mine, you know? So that, that can be interesting. But, um, the other thing is to just keep at it and always have, always have more submissions out 
never have one submission out at a time because when that comes back as a no, then then you've got nothing to look forward to. But if you've got another two or three, then there's a part of you can go, yeah, but well, maybe next month I'll get a yes. And then you rotate. So the game is to ha always have more submissions always out there. So there's always a, well, but maybe, maybe the next one. So much good advice and so reassuring, Mark. I can't tell you how, what a relief this is going to be for those who are in the trenches, doing the work, submitting it, to hear from someone who's been an editor and someone who has submitted their work and had to grapple with both sides. That helps us get a vision for what these editors are trying to do with their work and how they honestly react and respond to pieces and that there are many good poems that end up hearing no simply because it didn't fit the theme that emerged organically. I loved that part. I think that's just one example of why we need to just turn around and resubmit um, and keep finding yeah, the right and, home and for our piece. That's it. That's the phrase. Find the right home for it. Because if you go with the idea that, well, I mean, sometimes, you know, it's been rejected enough. And, uh, you know, uh, there's poems I've taken to Mimi Calvati, my long term mentor. And she said, well, you know what, Mark, maybe it's time to retire that one. And that's fine. But sometimes it is a case of, you know, I've had plenty of poems accepted um, by good publications that have been rejected several times by others. And it's it's about you can find the right home for it. I think there's a lovely phrase to use. Is there a, a number we should keep in mind? Like uh, when Mimi would tell us, <laughs> what's the num what's the number of rejections where, yeah, maybe. I don't know. Because, I mean, if, you know, no. famously, if J.K. Rowling had given up after, was it 29, 30 rejections, she wouldn't have sent it to the next one. So. True. Yeah. True. Yeah. You know. Uh, you said so a couple of things that were interesting that I wanted to just kind of explore with you. One was early in the discussion with me today, you've talked about just start reading poetry. Mm -hmm. Then later here, we're talking about creating poems. So we've got sort of the person who's taking it in and maybe for the first time starting to integrate that as part of their writing and creative process. And then you have people who are actually trying to write poetry and mm -hmm. you've suggested getting mentors, getting some sort of input with yeah. genre specific uh, feedback so that yeah. you can really learn and grow. Mm -hmm. So um, when, when would a person who's just starting to read po poetry know when they're ready to start getting that kind of um, education and input and where can they find it? I would say if you really want to get going, then, you know, go and look for a course. I mean, obviously look for a beginner's level one, but there's nothing, as well as the actual tuition and feedback you get, there's nothing like being in a room full of people who, who, who want to do the same thing. You know, I did a writer's retreat a few years ago and we had to go around the table on the first evening and what does everybody want? Uh, what does everybody want from the week? And I, I just said, I want a week where writing poetry is normal. And, you know, there was a few smiles around the table because people recognize that normally it's not. Normally they're the odd one out. Normally they're fighting for that time or trying to sneak it away from other things. Um, in terms of where to go, I mean, I'm in the UK. So to me, the obvious place would be the Arvin Foundation. Um, which does all kinds of different genres. It does poetry, screenwriting, fiction, nonfiction, and so on. There's also the Poetry School in London, which is a wonderful... Uh, well, they're based in London, but they have courses online and they have courses around the UK. Um, Arvin and Poetry School have been doing a lot more online since the pandemic came along. So that's one benefit from somebody like me who doesn't live in London anymore, uh, or indeed if you're in the States or elsewhere in the world. Um, I think that's, those are my main recommendations. Um, so it might depend on time zones and online availability, mm -hmm. but I'm sure wherever Definitely. you are, there will be, if you Google, you know, fiction for beginners or poetry for beginners or nonfiction mm -hmm. or whatever it is, um, that's there'll good. be something. How did you find Mimi? Ha, huh, good question. I found Mimi, I can't entirely remember. I've got a feeling that I was in the poetry cafe in London, in Covent Garden, which is a lovely space. It's, it's a cafe for poets and poetry, and they do readings and 
drinks and stuff. And the Poetry Society is upstairs where it used, it used to be. And there was a notice board. I think maybe I saw her advertised to doing, because Mimu did a course for the poetry school years ago called Versification, where we she took all the major types of meter and verse form, and we had to write them every week. You know, I think we started with Anglo-Saxon. And um, that was quite a demanding course, but also a really amazing one, because I'd at that point I had... I'd done an English degree, so I kind of knew all of this stuff, but Mimi showed us how the how the craft of it works. Not not okay, this is the result, and this is what it looks like when it's finished, but how do you write a Petrarchan sonnet? How do you write Terzarima? How do you write heroic couplets or blank verse or a villanelle? And why, you know, wh- how did it evolve? And why, you know, what does it do that other forms don't do? So she really conveyed the magic of the form, really. And that was, so a lot of the traditional forms in poetry, they're not exactly endangered species, but they're not the mainstream anymore. Most poets these days will write what's called free verse, which basically means it it doesn't have a regular meter, it doesn't have a regular rhythm, um, and it quite often doesn't rhyme. And and that's great, but it turns out that's not predominantly the kind of poet I am. I I really like the um, the pulse, as I call it, of the the rhythm of the meter, and I like the the rhyme. And and to me, there's a magical quality to those old forms. And Mimi really showed us how to to tap into that and use it in our own in our own voice. So that's how I met her, and I just. I, I kept going, going to different classes, and she's currently mentoring me one to one. So, so you must have just asked, and she said yes. I love it. Um, yeah, I mean, I would say again, if you've got a, if there's a writer that you really admire, and you think, oh, if I could write a bit more like them, or I'd really love to get their view on my work, or or just to you know get more of, learn more about how they do it. Just just Google, just see are they. Are they giving a talk? Do they are they being interviewed? I mean, there's loads of interviews on podcasts, for example. Um, are they offering classes? You know, is there any way that you can get into that person's orbit and you can learn a lot? When you are working on a poem or any creative project, how do you get started? Like, where do you start with an idea, with a phrase? Tell us a little bit about your process. A lot of the time, it 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 kind of mugs me. There's another thing that. Um, Paul Farley said, he said, I want the poem to mug me when I'm doing something else. Um, so it just it's the line that pops into your mind, which is quite a well-established phenomenon for a poet that um, Paul Valéry called it, was it called Le Verre Donné and Le Verre Calculé? So the, Le Verre Donné is the given line. Uh, this is the line that, you know, the muse or the unconscious or whatever we want to call it pops into your head. And then Le Verre Calculé is, you know, the, the line that you, you make yourself. So I, I was once on the, getting on my children on the tube and I had, um, I remember just setting them into their seat on the tube and then the line, terminate the human race came into my mind. And I thought, what the hell's that? <laughs> and it was the start of a poem. And it was interesting. As soon as I heard that line, I knew what shape and size poem it was and how it related to another poem that I knew. And it had nothing to do with children. So don't, 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 don't worry about that. But it just shows how inconvenient and how completely unconnected it can be with whatever's going on in, in the rest of your life. It'll pop into your mind. I think actually it is possible to, to kind of prime the pump, so to speak. So... Um, a few months ago, I had an idea that I wanted to have a ballad in my poetry collection because I had a few poems that were kind of almost ballads or next door to ballads. And I thought, oh, come on, you know, you could, you, you could got to do the actual thing. But I had no idea what I would write about. And then let me show you. You pulled out your notebook from childhood 
<laughs> and the ballad actually, that you were hiding. Well, I, it's interesting because that's probably the last time I'd written a ballad. No, maybe I wrote one in Mimi's class. But I went on the internet and I ordered this, which is the Faber book of ballads mm. from the 60s. Mm -hmm. And it's all lots of old traditional ballads, Irish, Scots, English, um, nearly all anonymous. And I just read it from cover to cover. And then, sure enough, a few days later, I wake up at three in the morning and there's my ballad starting to write itself. And it was a topic I would never have guessed. So that, you know, that can happen if you can kind of say that I'm going to mark out the, the ground and, and invite the spirit of the form in, then sometimes they answer the call. It, it reminds me of two things. And the first is just that you seem to have like that invitation that openness to whatever might come whenever it might come and then trusting it when it comes yeah that is one thing that strikes me about how you you approach what enters your orbit to, to use your phrase yeah. from before yeah. the other thing that strikes me too with that story in particular is um i'm a big sting fan and oh, right. there was this yeah. <laughs> there was this era where he says that he was creatively blocked and it was old music that had kind of been lost and forgotten i mm -hmm. think there's a ted talk that he gave about it but that's mm -hmm. where he went when he needed to reignite his creativity is going back to the older music and letting that stir something up in him i'm i'm not trying to quote him or anything but it yeah. seems like that you pulling that book off the shelf re revisiting what was long ago allowed you to bring that into your own contemporary life and poof, something came. What was the theme of that ballad? I can't tell you. It's because it's it, literally, well, actually, I tell you, it, it was about the pandemic. I can't quote it because I've sent it out on submissions. So I don't want to, oh, I don't want to jinx gotcha. it. Okay. But it was about the pandemic. And I never thought mm. I'd be writing about the pandemic because, you know, it's a big a, top. It's a big theme to explore. Well, also, and, and there is quite a lot of pandemic poetry <laughs> out there. But I just, just anyway, sometimes you, you've got to do what the poem tells you you're going to do. Hmm. There so, you go. There's a line. Yeah. Um, you got to do what the poem tells you to do. Hmm. But to your question about the, the tradition, I do think it's important to know whatever genre you're writing in. I mean, for me, it's poetry, but you know, it, different types of fiction, it will have begun at some point and there will be a, there's a backstory, there's a history, there's a tradition. And it's your job to, to know that and read that because it's evolved and you learn so much and there's a sense that you are, you know, you're carrying that torch forward mm. for the next generation. It's not, um, you know, we love to think we're so individual, particularly poets, goodness me, we love that. Um, but at the, at the same time, you know, we're, we're kind of part of a procession or part of a, a team even. And I think it's important to know, you know, what people further down the line have done. It's certainly, um, you know, and then the, I think my experience of writing the ballad was I wanted to tap into that old, very old oral ballad tradition. A lot of the people who wrote in inverted commas ballads were illiterate. They were, they were songs. They were sung and they were recited orally and, and changed. You know, they went through many hands. And just to pick up a, a kind of a wave, the metaphor that's come out is like a rippling wave from that and just to go, okay, that's, that's, that, will, that energy can flow into my poem. Where do you see, so you're, you're entering the conversation now, you're entering that with your own energy, adding to that pulse of poetry, that pulse of, of, of ideas. Where do you see yourself headed? As a poet. Um, as a creative person. I guess you can broaden it if you want to. Yeah. I don't, so the image that's coming to mind now, which is one that comes up quite a lot when I think about poetry, is it's because I, I think it's like a big group writing project. And the image I have is a, is a Persian carpet. And all the poets throughout history and all the different languages, they're all weaving it together simultaneously throughout time and space. And, of course, in the middle, you've got Shakespeare and Homer and Dante doing the big flourishes and whatever. But even if I could just do a little bird on the border, you know, or I could do a bit of the the trellis work or whatever. I'd be happy because I'm, you know, I'm I'm part I'm connected up to that grid, you know. So it comes back to that 
it's not to say I'm not ambitious to do the best I can, but it's more and more that phrase you used earlier, just find a home, just, just write the work that I feel I want to write and find a home for that and just pass it on to the next what a beautiful generation. Image. Yeah. Yeah. That's not to, to say I don't thread. have ego and <laughs> ambition and all of that, but you know, um, there's a time and a place for that. And, and that's not really where the real writing comes from. Mark, that's so beautiful. The image you've given us, the desire to be one color, one thread woven into that, uh, into that carpet, into that tapestry. I'd be happy to be part of the fringe. I don't mind. Great. Great. <laughs> Just straighten it out a little bit. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, because that adds to it, right? We're all adding to it. Yeah. And, um, and when it comes to ideas, I think there's a common word that people use, which is this ecosystem of ideas that we're all contributing mm, to this yes. giant pond. Of, yeah, yeah, or, yeah. Uh, that, but Very I love much. your image so much more beautiful, a much stronger metaphor and one that I think we could all dream of. To add a little right. color to this world. Yeah. Um, any parting words that can inspire us and leave us ready to go do the work? Well, I've got a little suggestion for, for a little game you could play with some writing. If, if you're remotely curious about writing poetry or just using poetry as a way to look more closely at the words that you use. So, for instance, if you're a novelist, then you will know far more about plot and story and narrative structure than I will ever know. But what poetry can help you do is to really home in on the words and that close reading that you were talking about. So I would say you don't even need to write anything new for this little game. I would say take a piece of writing of yours that you that you pretty well like, you know, that, that doesn't make you cringe when you look at it, that you think, okay, I, I like that. And then I want you to to copy paste it and, and get about one page of A4's worth, or maybe half a page. Half a page is probably better. Then I want you to play the game of, of chopping it up into lines. Because, you know, that's really the only difference between verse and prose is that the verse means a turn. So it does, somebody once said it's writing that doesn't meet the right hand margin. So, you know, and it's debatable whether that, and it's not the same as poetry, which we could argue all day about what the definition of that is. But for verse, it's divided up into lines. So take your poem and divide it up into lines. And don't don't get to try and get, do them kind of much of a muchness, roughly the same length. And just look at it on the page and read it like that and see what difference that makes. And see if it changes the way you see the words or the way you might sp try speaking it aloud. That would be really interesting. Read the prose aloud and then read that aloud. Then um, take that same text and divide it up into, into stanzas of four lines each. And don't, don't play with it. Just, just chop it up and just put an extra line space in. And then have a look and see what difference that makes. And you can keep playing. You can try it with two line, three line five line stanzas, you can try longer or shorter lines. You could try it with what they call verse paragraphs where you have, you know, one section is all together as a block and then you break it up and then there's another section. And copy all the different versions of this and maybe print them out and you can just see, that will teach you a load about poetic form and about the effect of it without anyone having to explain it to you because you will see and feel and sense the difference between the same words in different arrangements. So that's that's the game I invite you to play. I like that game. I will play it this afternoon. Thank you, Mark. How can people get to know you better? Where do you want to send them? If you listen to podcasts, wherever you listen to podcasts, search for A Mouthful of Air and you will find us. Um, or online, a mouthful of air.fm. Now, the great thing about the website is remember, poetry is what I call an amphibious art, which means it can live in two different elements. It's not water and air, but it's it can live on the page and it can live in your ear. So if you go to the website, you will find the text of all the poems. And it's can be interesting. You listen to the the audio and you look at the text and you know, the, and there's also a transcript of, of every episode with links to all the technical terms I mention. So if I, I do try and explain them as we go, but if you haven't, if you want to know more about it, then go there and there will be a link to explain 
all of that. And you can sign up and you can get it delivered via email. You get the audio and the email, or you can just subscribe and listen to the podcast. And I do have some people who only read it because they just prefer to read, and that's cool too. So so that's that's where to go. I think on Twitter, it's a mouthful of air. And on Instagram, I'm putting the poems on Instagram, it's Air Poets. You are investing in writers so generously. This is incredible. I think we talked about finding a class, finding a mentor. You can be our first mentor, I believe, with all of this. Shucks, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Well, thank you for your time, too. And it's been a pleasure to get to know you better, to get to know your work, and to introduce you to listeners of Ann Croker Writing Coach. Well, well thank, thank you. you. I mean, you know, with a, with a coach and a podcaster, you ask great questions, and, and it was a real delight to talk to you. So thank you. Are you ready to make poetry part of your writing routine? You can let Mark continue to guide and inspire you through his podcast, A Mouthful of Air. I'll link to that and all things related to Mark at ancroker.com slash a mouthful of air. That's ancroker.com slash a mouthful of air. I can't wait to hear your best takeaway from this interview. Thank you for being here. I'm Ann Croker, writing coach.